All right, all right. Woo. Welcome, welcome to another episode of Mornings with Movers. Got myself, Dwight Mack of Max Moving Training, and we got Ryan Marsh. He's just a former mover in the industry. No way he knows. Uh, <laughs> what's going on, Ryan? What's up, man? How are you doing? I'm good morning. Good. Happy Thursday. Yes, yes. It's 9 a.m. Time to get the day going. I wake yeah. up to, hey, we got to clean it uh, that's how we're going to start today. All right. <laughs> hey, by the way, let me see that left hand of yours again. Uh, can you see it? Oh, you can see it in the video. Yeah, huh? man. Okay. Congratulations. Uh, I saw you over, uh, was it face page there? Mm -hmm. I said, you get married this weekend, but it was really cool to uh, see y'all dressed to the nines with the bride, man. It looks like it was a great time. So, okay. We, now, we can't, all on that. I don't know if we short, uh, what is it called? Um, um, short word in it, but we get to say face page. That sounds like we get a little old now. Facebook, Facebook, whatever you know what the heck I'm saying. I don't. Get, I'm not a big, <laughs> guy, big social person, but uh, yeah, face Facebook. Are you on the book? <laughs> yeah, we got to sound like the young guys. Yeah, he was on the book. <laughs> yeah, dude, my kid's not even a Facebook. He's like the Insta chat, Insta, whatever those things are. Insta, Insta chats. <laughs> Instagram, he's all that stuff. He's in the, he's in all that stuff. Facebook's just kind of like the that's that's the old man's game, apparently, according to him. Before you know it, it's gonna be Pinterest and all these other channels. And I don't <laughs> even know what those do yet, but I'm just like, you know what? I've heard of them. And I'm just like, you know what, you already got too many social media channels out there to be getting set up on. I don't know the whole ins and outs of LinkedIn yet, let alone trying to learn Instagram and TikTok. I'm just like, you know what? Yeah, Can I LinkedIn, just put a post? Uh, LinkedIn's like my only social. I like it because there's just no garbage in there. There's no there's no drama. There's no nonsense. It's actual, you know, really most of the part, really, really good people just uh you know put some really great information out there. I feel like uh LinkedIn's more educational for me rather than oh, yeah. become depressed after reading, scrolling through depression, depression. I'm like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I think that's the that's why I think LinkedIn is kind of like, I ain't going to say boring, because it's interesting. It's very educational, but it's just like, where's the drama, see, too? <laughs> there is not. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, that drama is like that wake up thing. Like, you know, like if you see a, a good football play or whatever the case is, you're going to probably find that on, or on Facebook versus you're finding it on LinkedIn. And, you know, sometimes you want that motivation, but then I get it. You get a lot of negative energy as well from facebook as well like i was saying right before we signed down here i don't even know what i was talking about i was actually like cleaning out my desk here but garbage in is garbage out right so <laughs> kind of see that uh you know that's kind of how face page is to me but what else is going on man what's going on in the industry what have you heard what are you seeing huh. i haven't heard too much besides the same little struggles you know everybody seemed to be doing okay for the most part um but I haven't heard of overjoyous about schedules are booked up till this point, or people are just saying, hey, you know, I've heard people say, yeah, it's been the worst year ever. But, oh. you know, um, yeah, I don't, I, honestly, I don't really know what's really going on as far as lead providers. I know that they're getting very, very expensive. Yeah. Um, but other than that, you know, I think people just need to repivot, understand that, hey, we're in a different time. Um, keep going after what they've been used to doing, but change it up a little bit. You know, if lead providers are a little more expensive, instead of stick with them for 90 days, maybe stick with them for 60 days. I, you know, I don't I don't know, but you need to have the volume coming in the door. Yeah, no doubt. I just know like the lead thing. I do hear a lot about leads. People want more leads, more leads, more leads. Because uh, they feel that the quality of the leads that they're they're getting are not just what they used to be. Um, and on top of that, not only are they getting the leads, even though they're paying for exclusive leads, they're finding that, you know, the movers two, three doors down are also getting those same leads. But again, it goes back to how are they handling their leads? Um, mm -hmm. If you need more, you just need to actually sink your claws into the ones that you have. So especially if you're paying for leads, I mean, 40, 50 bucks a clip. And I know you can get them for less. I know people actually pay more as well, which is uh, rather wild to me. But uh got to sink your claws in these leads. You got to treat them differently at this point. So, yeah, I would think that you got to be wise about your budget too. Like if you feel like everybody's going towards Google guaranteed, maybe they are, maybe they are a great service, but if they're still around $70 a lead, 
price point, and it maybe they're a little higher now because everybody's migrating over that way, then maybe, you know, I don't know. I don't, maybe that's not a, a source that you want to put all your marketing eggs into if you're not making that much money. Yeah. You know, um, if you're only making about 50, and obviously these are smaller guys, if you're only making about 50 to $60,000 a month, uh, maybe doing Google Guaranteed isn't in your best interest because how much are you going to really be spending? If you even, if you get 10 leads, that's what, $700? That's, you know, <laughs> I have a tough time with the, with the paid leads again, in my, all my years in the industry, we never paid for leads, right? We, I guess we, we didn't have to, I mean, we had a great reputation. We had a lot of referral, we had a lot of accounts and we were well diversified. So we weren't just necessarily leaning on paid ad. I mean, I, I couldn't fathom, but I know there's a lot of companies out there that leverage it. They, they, they do really, really well. I mean, it was cool having um, Matthew with uh, the moving letters AI, because that was, I actually chatted with him this past week. Uh, or this week, I should say. Yesterday, actually, it was. Wednesday. Oh. I lose track of days. Yeah, yeah. Had a real cool conversation with him. Got to learn more about what he does, how he does it. And, uh, you know, we we did that back in the day. I say back in the day, you know, 10, 12 years ago. But feels like it was a hell of a lot longer than that. And that worked. That was mm -hmm. kind of like our, our paid lead, sort of, say, is <laughs> filling out postcards and shipping those bad boys in the mail. And it worked. It worked. Yeah, we try to do it. We try to do it in house as well. Um, we started with movingleads.com and I just couldn't get behind it. Like, you know, and I'm not gonna say any one postcard company is bad, bad or worse than other. I just feel like when you don't have that person's contact information where you can re verify that, hey, people are actually shipping these postcards out on our behalf. Cause I had the same thing with USA. I was like, well, hey, damn, we done sent out almost a thousand postcards and we didn't get like, one of the spots back yet. Why didn't you send out the postcards? <laughs> you know, and, you know, um, they would say over there, yeah, we're, the postcards are going out, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, I don't believe it. You know, I'm not even getting any like real returns back, meaning that, you know, there's a bad address. Yeah. So... Anyway, that what? stuff takes that stuff takes time. Like if you're gonna if you send out a thousand postcards tomorrow, and if you think you're gonna be your schedule is gonna be jam packed the following week, like not gonna happen. That's just kind of a constant flow. You're gonna have to keep on, keep on putting the foot on the pedal and keep on rolling with that. Um, at some point, I mean, at some point, yeah, you're gonna have to set a date and time or whatever, and you know, have some metrics as to, is this working? Is it worth? Is it worth the amount of spend that we're doing? Um, you know, after three k, we haven't booked a single job yet. After Seven thousand dollars spent. We booked one job. I mean, I'd be tracking the snot out of that, but I'm sure that there's uh, they track that for you too as well, right? Yeah, I think they track it. We just don't get any reporting from you know these companies, which I think that will be really helpful. I think the, a tough part, like how does this work? Like, say uh, you know, you get a postcard through one of these guys, they send it out, right? I'm the customer that got your postcard right here, Dwight, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, ooh. Max moving. Oh, here's a QR code. Call this number, what have you. What if I go in and Google and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, they got good, good reviews. Good. This, I'm just going to call them. Then I grab my cell phone, call Max moving, book my move. You know, ABC letters company is not getting the credit for that because you're not thinking it's coming from that. Mm. It just called you organically. Right. So they Googled you, you know, so now if I were to call you off this card or do the QR code or whatever, then yeah, you're going to absolutely know, Hey, this came from the postcard people, the moving letters, AI, what have you. But I feel like a lot of people, they, they get the information, they look and then they go right to Google. They do their due diligence and then they call you. So if there was a way to capture that, I think that'd be really, really cool. Cause I feel like a lot of people are, you know, it's it's kind of putting a dent in the uh, the metrics for some of these companies because you just can't track that, right? Yeah. Now there are some things, there are some things where it marketing where they actually track your path, like you mentioned. So oh, yeah. they use, if they use a QR code and then a QR code takes them to Google and then they call you from Google, whatever the case is, it can mm -hmm. tell you their path that they took to get to you. But are your salespeople really paying attention? To the, to the the beginning path, or they paying attention to what popped up on the call ID. Oh, Google Caller. Oh, okay. Let me put this in into the CRM as a Google lead. 
Yeah, your sales reps just grabbing that lead and running with it. Um, the average sales rep, I would say. Yeah, and I, and that's the thing. You don't want. I don't feel like you want your boots on the ground to be like. You want them to be detailed, but you don't want them to be all into the metrics of things that like managers do, because then it takes away from what they need to be doing. One guy told me. Um, one of my colleagues told me. Not colleagues. Uh, one of my um students told me that um what was it oh um he had he transitioned one of his movers to a salesperson because they he realized that they had sales experience or so like that but he was like i don't know if i'm overwhelming them because you know it's it day in day out they're just on they're on the phone and i don't know if i should be giving them a new task or whatever the case is and i'm kind of like it's just like muscle memory. Like when the guys are in the field all day long, that's what they're doing day in, day out. Same thing when it comes to being on the phones. It's, it takes time. But hey, you start with 10 calls to 15 to, you know, whatever the case is. It does get tired. Don't get me wrong. But that's why you got to incentivize. Absolutely. No, yeah. Being on the phone all day definitely is uh, not my favorite thing to do. You know, 50, <laughs> 50, 70 dials a day. No, no, no. I did that for a little bit. And Although it was fun, I learned a lot. And obviously, I got a heck of a lot better because yeah, everyone thinks they can pick up the phone and dial and cold call. Like everyone thinks they're a good cold cut. It's tough. It's mm -hmm. tough, to, you know, reading the mind of a customer over a potential prospect over the phone and what have you. But it was how many times I got called every name in the book, hung up on, told me I'm terrible. I'd never be a good this. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so I think everybody should definitely experience, uh, you know, at least a couple of weeks of cold calling, 50 to 70 calls a day. Holy cow. Yeah. So uh, as you, well, I think as I mentioned to you, so I'm a, um, I'm actual store manager now for my telecommunications company. I'm not going to say which right now because you know I'm not. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, um, so with that being said, I have to oversee a whole store, go through the whole logistics of making sure inventory, everything, every, you know, obviously making sure everything goes smooth because if it doesn't, it can come back on me. Yeah. Um, and one of my reps was like oh hey so i had him doing cold calling because we get a lot of marketing leads and um they have been used to making calls like you know the company says hey you need to make calls but you can go right in the crm and log a call and not actually make a call and it'll count as made a call but it does no good to do that because you're not really bringing in any business so my my store originally was one of the worst stores in the in the market at um ninth in the district and like 47th in the market out of 49. And um now the store is turned around with just a couple of processes implemented, you know, where now it's 25 in the district out of 49 and fifth in the market out of 10, you know, and it's just a matter of little processes that I've taken. And I said, okay, hey, you know what? We need to be making the marketing calls. When you have these calls, it's not going to feel comfortable at first because you're not used to doing it. But as you take those no's, you will start to reword the way you approach it. And then you will start to realize that you keep that customer on the phone and very similar to moving. Hey, you may not get a yes right away. Even though moving sells itself a lot, a little bit more, you may not get a yes right away because it's basically maybe what that customer is looking for is price. And, you know, maybe your sales script isn't together. Nah. So, you know, it comes down to, and they ask me, they're like, hey, maybe, maybe we should create a sales script. And it just uh, immediately brought me back to my moving days. And I was like, oh, sales script. I think you're putting a little bit of that max moving training on these guys, I feel like. Just a little <laughs> bit. A little bit. No, you know, the calling is, you know, one, you got to have a purpose for a call, right? You just mm -hmm. can't say whatever. I mean, have something great to share, to tell, to show, or what have you. Um, but then that, even if the call does not go great, uh, what we tell all our folks is just grab one piece of like critical information from that call, something that you can make a note on that particular customer, store it in the system. So when we come back with another piece, we have another reason to call. We can kind of bring up that previous conversation, touch on that one nugget or what have you. I mean, the more information you get on a call, the better, but it's definitely mm -hmm. tough. Yeah, oh, it definitely is. It's never um, the safest thing to do. Yeah, and everybody thinks they can do sales and they data, data, data that, that person. But 
sales is, is definitely a technique. And, you know, when a customer does say no, or maybe in so many words, you got to know how to twist it, you know? And one of the videos I made in, as a maximum with training was the three pillar closing techniques that you can use. So understanding the temperature in the room, if the customer is like on the fence where, oh no, your price is too expensive, whatever the case is, don't give up, right? In that case, you know, always come back with a rebuttal. But if they're just like really on that side of the fence, where it's like absolutely, okay, you understand that you can't go off another products at that point in time. Yeah. You know, but if they're right on the, in, in between the fence where they're like, I can go either way, hey, you know, let's see what the root of the issue is that we can lean them more towards our way and understand that it's a technique. It's not just, well, I gave, I, I gave them my best shot. Yeah. You know, go through the same script from customer that said no to the customer that says yes. Ultimately, if you know the script has been working. Do you, you, guys, record, you guys record all your calls? So we did record record all our calls and we would use them as training um as a training method for when we sat down with our sales reps weekly, where we would say, Well, hey, you know, we pull um I'll have the sales manager pull two random calls from each rep, um, just so that we didn't help hold up the meeting too long. And then we would go through the process where all of my upper my upper management team, operations, sales manager, sales reps, or no, actually, sorry. Um, my sales reps and sales manager and myself, we would be on that call just so they didn't feel overwhelmed. Yep. And we would listen to the whole call and we would ask them, hey, ask another rep because obviously we don't, we can't ask the same rep. Hey, ask another rep, hey, what do you think about that call? What do you think we could have done better on that call? And, you know, get their feedback and then we'll get the feedback from the opposite rep as well. Like, hey, what's going on on this call? And then they'll take that and they'll say, okay, you know what? I could probably try it. Or I could probably look to ask the inventory or whatever the case is. And we had a checklist of everything we're looking for. Hey, did they did they mention your name when they answered the phone? Hey, this is Max Moving Company. Um, hello, well, um, hello, thank you for calling Max Moving Company. This is uh, Sherry. You know, did they say their name? If they didn't say their name, okay, well, they got a ding in that area. Why are you saying your name? Why are you, you know, because <laughs> introduce yourself. Yeah, you know, and we would go there in the whole checklist. And if they answered everything correct, and, but they didn't get the sale, then we'll try to see where they may have dropped the ball. Yeah. And uh, say that again. No, I say once a week we do. We we call it the game tape review. So bringing all our BDRs, all our reps, and base literally like it's actually so much fun. I feel like it's game day. Like when this happens, everybody. It, you know, I'm sure everybody got a little nervous at first, but everybody. Uh, you know, one one rep a week, basically a really good call that they had. And then they pick a call that they feel is really, really bad. And we play it out and then we stop it at certain spots and basically review. Be like, hey, what do you think so far, guys, on this this part? How was the opener? How was this? How do you handle this? How do you handle that? Or how does she handle this or what have you? And you'd be surprised. Like, you, you learn so much. Well, not, see, you wouldn't be surprised. You know this. You learn so much from listening to calls, breaking down calls. But, you know, not only listening to the bad calls, but the great calls as well to see, man, how did it? Because the call started off not so great but how the one rep was able to pivot really quickly and just kind of lean into where this, this particular person was saying and what they were looking for. And, you know, the ability to pivot quick like that, uh, you know, change the whole game of the call, but yeah, it's a good practice to get into. And, you know, of course I was nervous the first time my calls got put out there. I'm like, Oh boy, here's a good <laughs> one. Here's a bad one. Like tear it up guys. But no, our, our team is really cool with, uh, with that. And we just have a really good time with each other and, you know, we we can rip on each other's phone calls and uh, know that, hey, it's not nothing personal. It's like, hey, we all want to get better. We're all, we're all here for, you know, we're all here to win the big trophy. So, that's mm -hmm. really, you know, but you got to have the culture within your organization to do that too, right? So. Yeah, no, you definitely do. Um, And they got to be coachable. If they're not coachable, you'll know it right away. And you want them to challenge you. Hey, you're not always right either, but you have experience. Yeah. So it was like, hey, you know, what What went wrong when I call? Oh, well, I think from my manager standpoint that you could have probably did it this way. Well, we've been having issues. If we tried it this way, sometimes we've been getting better success, you know, going this step first and then going that step second. And you're kind of like, OK, let me let me listen to a couple more calls. Let me see, you know, exactly maybe what you're talking about. 
and you have these recordings at your disposal. But again, you from a manager standpoint, uh, CEO standpoint, not a manager, uh, you don't want to spend too much time in one area unless you really feel like it's a super weak point in your company. So for me, that's why I broke it down to five departments. You know, you have your compliance department, uh, which, you know, includes everything from making sure that you're legit in the industry, your um, insurance is covered, et cetera. Um, you have your HR department, which obviously everybody know HR, but that's where you need to worry about your benefits. So you need to worry about, you know, hey, is your your enrollment process seamless? Like if you bring somebody on, how long does it take to get that person up and running? You yeah. know, um, then you have operations. Operations is, hey, making sure your blankets and your inventory and everything like that is included. Making sure your guys are, you know, the process of your guys getting in and getting out in the morning is is on point, spotless. You know, um, customer customer satisfaction as well is, is part of um, operations. Then you have sales. Obviously, sales are sales. You know, it's sales, what you need to do is sales. Um, and then you got marketing, you know, and those are the five main areas that if you break them down and you really work on each area, I like to spend one month, one month um, at a time working on each department. So at least twice a year, I'm working on that department to make sure that that department isn't the weakest of links. Yep. If you had to bucket that, like out of those five, five areas, what would you say is the number one and number two area of most yeah. critical, most importance for your moving company today? Um, I would say that it has to be, it has to be hmm, number one and two. That is, well, in order to make the business run, you need your marketing and sales dialed in. You know, everything else you could kind of figure out at that point. But if you don't have no customers coming in, no, no, no calls going out. You know, when I first started, we had maybe one or two jobs a week, <laughs> and I was on moving help. So you know, it was just like. Geez, am I really gonna have to cut this guy a check for two hours? You know, and I, you know, and it was bad, but it was like, okay, you know what? Let's stay consistent. Let's get some money up. Once we get enough money up, we can um, do what we need to do to get payroll services involved. Because Lord, I'm not cutting a check with payroll services for two hours a week. There's just no way. Um, you know, get the payroll services up. Get the compliance stuff up. Make sure that hey, we got enough vendors. So one of the things when my sales team didn't have enough calls coming in, I had my sales team, hey, I need you looking up leads. Here's the process to finding more leads. Um, just present them to me. I'll do the research myself to figure out whether I want to go with them or not. Yeah. And it got to the point where, like I said, I averaged about 37,000 leads a year. And we didn't close out on all of them, but they were numbers. And they allowed me to be able to filter. And people were like, well, geez, you had a horrible closing rate when you think about it. Okay, that's fine, because my goal wasn't to have 37,000 moves. In. My goal was only to have about 500 to 600 moves. In. But I knew that I would need to filter through a lot of BS to get there. Yep. And then you also got to think operations at that point. Hey, can you handle that capacity of 600 moves? What, did I, what does that look like per week, per month, et cetera? And then think about the strength of your 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 industry, your uh, market. Okay, well, hey, we know winter in New York is going to be freezing cold from late December to maybe March, or April. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've seen it snow in May. So yeah. September to April, yuck. Wow. So you know, so you're just like, okay, well, hey, you know what? Where we've only ever averaged maybe like twenty to thirty jobs in in January because of how freezing cold it was. So that may only that 20 to 30 jobs out of 600 jobs may only add up to roughly 5% of your total job count for the year. So understand that you got to average 5% in January. And whatever you do, you know, maybe maybe 6% in February, but your summer months are going to be where it's at. So understand your volume, understand how much capacity you can put out, understand that these are the con these are the months you're going to have to have that conversation with your guys. Hey guys, look. You know, I I want to give you guys the hours, but the hours isn't there because it's negative seven degrees. And I'm sure you understand, but I know you got to still feed your family. Um, but thanks to Uber, thanks to Lyft, thanks to Instacart, that these guys don't have to go out and get a full-fledged job 
just to survive in those off season months. And they could just do little gigs just to keep the money coming in. I, I bucketed things a little bit. So I, I agree with what you're saying. I, I bucketed things just a tiny bit differently. Um, compliance and safety was number one. First and foremost, if, if your company's not compliant and safety of the people, you don't have anything, right? If you're not, if you're not running legally, who are you really, right? You're just a mm-hmm. rogue guy. Just that. My second main focus was operations. And hear me out on this one. You're probably thinking I'm nuts, Dwight, but uh, you, you can have all the sales in the world, right? But if your operations department is broken, you're just pissing all that away. If you're not dispatching jobs correctly, if you're putting too many guys on a job or too many people on a job or too less people on a job, jobs extend this, that profits start going into and, and getting hacked and whacked and what have you. So to me, operations is, you know, minus compliance and safety, operations is like the number one piece. That is the wheel. So if you got rid of operations in your moving company, but you had the best marketing, the best sales and you were compliant, what happens? Your sales guys are booking a ton of moves. Who is making that operational wheel go around? Who's making sure the trucks are this, the guys are this, the customers are this? It's just not there. So for me, compliance and safety was number one. Operations was number two. Um, Sales was really almost like like third Mm. for me. Yeah, at least it's third. (laughs) Yeah, I would say, I mean, obviously HR is up in there. So I guess people can, you know, wave different flags between HR, sales, marketing, what have you. But you know, you can book all the business in the world, but if your operations team can't handle it, if there's no visibility to that side, if your operations is broken, what's the point of booking all those moves if ultimately it's going to end up in service failures, claims, uh, misuse of trucks, crews, and what have you? you you're just your profits are going down the drain. Um, mm-hmm. Then obviously, once you get to sales ramping, it, to me, then marketing is the the to me is almost almost like the last piece. People yeah. are going to you, you need a basic presence. People are going to find you if you're if, if you're compliant. You're safe, you're reputable, you got tight operations, five-star reviews are there, sales are coming in. Marketing to me is kind of that, I'll say icing on the cake, but I know a lot of people disagree with me on this one, but uh, (laughs) that's what, uh, hey, everybody has different experience. I just, I know companies that went heavy into sales, heavy into marketing, blowing sales out of the water, but at the same time, they weren't compliant, their trucks weren't this, trucks weren't registered, didn't have DOT, didn't have motor carrier numbers, none of that stuff. These guys are getting caught at DOT checkpoints, paying ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar fines. Mm. There goes your or operations is not experienced enough. There's many holes and gaps. So sales is booking fifteen jobs. Operations doesn't know that they can't handle fifteen jobs. Sales doesn't know they can't handle fifteen jobs. So what happens? You book fifteen, you can only handle eight. What happens to the other seven? Someone's okay. calling the customer, being like, "Hey, <laughs> can you go a different date? I can't this, I can't that." Now you got bad reviews. You got pissed off customers. Um, yeah, so compliance yeah. and safety one, ops two, sales at the end of the horn for me. Yeah, I believe I believe um you're you know you're definitely right about that. Um and I think like with operation, well, one of the things I did for my company, and I guess I call that on an operation side of things from a CEO standpoint, is I made to-do list one for everybody you know, with bullet points, you know, and it was like, okay, well, hey, you know what, sales rep, you're doing this, sales manager, you're doing this, uh, dispatcher, you're doing this, general manager, you're doing this, controller, you're doing this. And then basically what I do is I stack them side by side. And then it's almost like an organizational chart, but for task, where you're like, okay, what is it that everybody's doing? And then what is it that I don't need to do it? And once you have that all situated and you really know what you need to focus on, because the bad, the, the bad thing that most business owners fall, the trap that they fall into is that they feel like they got to do everything. And once you write out these tasks and like, well, hey, you know what? I need either you can be very tight on it and say, hey, I need this sign every day, making sure that they're looking at it. Or use KPIs to measure the performance of the important stuff of that to-do list. Okay, well, hey, sales manager, I need to make sure that the desks are clean every day and, you know, take the trash out at the end of the day. And, you know, we need to make sure that this office is looking very spotty because, you know, we got the sales reps on the phone. So you need to be doing something. That may not be an important KPI to be measuring at the end of the period. But, (laughs) But when it comes to compliance, as far as, hey, is anybody's credit card information exposed? Is, 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 you know, um, are there any breaches? Are there any, you know, 
how are we processing credit cards throughout the day? You know, that becomes a KPI where you're like, well, hey, you know what? We need to make sure we're in compliance because we don't want to get sued for somebody's information getting out there or the reps, you know, mishandling information. So ultimately, it's a bigger picture in everything that you want them to do, but not everything on that to-do list is necessarily important. Yeah. So we did that. We were big into role clarity, right? So I hate, I personally hated, you know, you hear that, oh, this, this is what you do. This is the task you got to do. Check the boxes at that. So we were really big into kind of role clarity, right? And then what we also did is we took each individual role and said, hey, list everything that you do in a day or a week or a month or what have you. List everything out. So, of course, everybody's just, you know, filling their piece, excuse me, pieces of paper, typing in their Google Sheets or whatever the case is, listing everything that they can do. And then we basically just kind of did a one, two, and three. One is like extremely important. Like this is a main piece of your role. Two is like a secondary thing. And then three is like, eh, why am I really doing this? And we, we ran this exercise quite frequently and it worked really well because you found out a lot of people when they should have had a lot of ones next to the things that they were doing, had a lot of twos and even more threes, mm -hmm. uh, which was very interesting. So it's like, hey, why is our lead sales guy or our top closing guy always hanging out over here doing this, touching this and that? That's really a priority for a move coordinator, not necessarily for a sales rep to be doing now, it's okay for the sales rep to do that if the move coordinator is tied up or what have you. Um, but, you know, we get back to that role clarity piece. Why is, you know, why is person A doing majority of person B's work? Why is person B not doing a majority of their work? They're messing around in, in, in person C's work. I think that's just, you know, especially when it comes to moving companies, you know, and you know this from, from being in the industry for so long. I mean, a lot of people wear so many hats, mm -hmm. many, many, many but we also oftentimes forget like, what is our main hat? What is our secondary hat? And then what, are, what is the hat that we have to put on at certain times throughout the year, whether it be during peak, during non-peak or whatever the case is. Um, so we were, we were very good and driven with that role clarity piece. Everybody knew what everybody's role was. I mean, when that phone rang, that was person A had three rings to pick that phone or two rings to pick that phone up. If they were tied up, busy, what have you, person B knew that, Hey, when that phone was ringing, now that becomes priority one for them. And for some reason, a person two couldn't pick it up, right? Now, person three, that became priority. So everybody had priorities, but they also you know, had to be able to pivot and switch based on what person A, B, and C had on their had on their plate that day, that second, that minute, or what have you. You know, the crazy part is, so I've always been a ring counter as well, you know, where, hey, you know what? We don't want the phone to ring more than three times. Technically, you should be answering on the first ring. But if it did ring more than two times, Live, that must mean that a rep must be busy on the phone. If they're busy on the phone, then that ring, that third ring needs to be forwarded to the next person. So again, one of the operational strategies, even though it was more geared to sales, was hey, after two rings, what does that call flow look like? Well, after two rings, we need to, the sales manager need to be getting the phone because we don't need the sales rank manager's phone ringing all the time because the sales manager isn't the person that's mainly on the phones. Like they're handling a bunch of different tasks. So if operations is calling sales sales manager directly, they now know that there's a definitive person that's important on the other line calling them to ask them a question. Whereas if the phones are everybody's phones is ringing at the same time, it could be a customer, it could be operations, it could be you know with somebody else. So by the third ring. The, the phone, obviously the sales manager is in the same room as the, the reps, but at, by the third ring, it rings on the sales manager phone as well as their phones. So now she's like, okay, well, hey, hey, thank you for calling, blah, blah, go through her whole spiel. And then if there is a rep that becomes available and she's maybe in the middle of a call or whatever, uh, in the middle of that call, but she didn't get too far, hey, what I'm going to do is thank you for all your information. I'm going to forward it over to all sales rep because they're the ones who's going to get commission for it. And they're going to be able to take, take, take it away. And kind of be able to redirect it as needed. And, you know, same thing with um with my movers. If my movers are calling in after a job, hey, call this line specifically. Don't call sales and bombard them with, oh, well, hey, we're about to clock out. Well, look, sales can't clock you out. So now they got to go through the process of forwarding you to operations. So call yeah. line extension two. And extension two will handle, will handle your call. I'm glad you're saying this, right? Because as you're talking, I'm like thinking of something that we did a couple of years ago. 
And what is your thought on having a human? So you're calling my moving company, we'll say. So Dwight's calling Ryan's uh, wild wildcat movers or whatever, not wildcat movers, but whatever you want to call it there. How do you feel about a having somebody pick, having a the kind of I don't want to say pecking order it sounds terrible but having a human pick up the phone hey this is Ryan's moving company how can I assist you or how do you feel about you get that automated thing that picks up press one for sales press two for ops press three for claims press four for OA services press five for DA services what is your thought on both because this is this is interesting um, I know I, I well, talked I a lot. It, it depends because a lot of people that are using that are using people from overseas, which becomes a language barrier. And, and they're like, oh, I don't really, I'm not really trying to deal with these people. I can barely understand them, blah, blah, blah. But then you get those people that says, oh, all this AI, the robot stuff. Oh, man, I can't believe that, that, that menu is all internal, though. So, like, say you're the sales guy. If somebody presses one, Dwight's phone rings. If they press operations, Ryan's phone rings. If they press claims, our claims person phone rings. Well, no, that, that makes we sense. Test, we tested this out, and it was interesting because we, we had such a heavy call vibe. I was like, oh, I'm busy on the phones. I'm this, I'm that. I'm always on the phone. So we're like, hey, let's set this thing up where we can try to route the incoming calls based on what the you know potential customer prospect needs mm -hmm. are to their specific areas. But once we started tracking that, right, we thought it was working, but I was getting operational calls all day long. I was getting <laughs> OADA calls all day long. I was getting claim calls. I'm like, what, what, why? What? I'm like, what? Wait, wait, you looking to schedule a move? All right, well, what are you doing in claims? Um, so we actually ended up getting rid of that system because we found like customers were just more or less on there. Like, A, they, it could have been a bad menu that we had too, right? They didn't really know what they were claiming. Like consumer calls, OADA, they have no clue what that is. Looking for DA services, press four. The average consumer has no idea what DA services are. So like, eh, you know, four. So we end up going back to kind of the old school route where, hey, that phone rings. Yeah, everybody's phone rings. Well, the crazy part is when we had two locations, we had the same, everybody had the same phone system. Just everybody had different extensions. So like um, Florida will probably have all extensions of like 200 and New York will have all extensions of 100 and, you know, General managers would have a weird number, like a hundred, like a hundred, um, two hundred. You know, so you knew it was like a, a routine of who you could contact. You just got to press the right um, extension. And when a consumer called, it would be like, "Oh, well, thank you for calling a smoother company. Uh, press one for sales." And then when they press one for sales, um, looking to move in New York, press one. Looking to move in Florida, press two. And you know, and then that's kind of like how we started gearing to specific locations. But ultimately, we were gonna we were looking to make it more like um, a central hub for our sales. So as the sales started to ramp up, we started to hire people in New York that would remotely book sales for Florida. And when they press two at the second level of the, of the prompts, it would go to that rep phone in New York. And that direct knew that, hey, this was a Florida lead. Let me start booking it that way. Yeah, that's one that's another thing I always hate is like, and anytime I call anybody, press one for sales. And it's like, man, just hearing the word sales as a customer, like, oh man, I'm gonna get sold, I'm gonna get this. Like, I'm already thinking commissions in my mind, like how much commission is this guy gonna make? I mean, I'm the biggest sucker when it comes to buying anything anyway. So we got rid of the, you know, the sales. We didn't really use sales terminology um, in our lingo. We basically relocation guides. So we, we were guiders. We were tour guides. We were not salespeople. Because I feel like anytime you enter that, again, just more of a, a psyche piece. Anytime you enter sales, commissions, how much, price flex, all this. But hey, if, you, if you're if you reaching out to a relocation guide, someone's going to guide you through your move. To me, it's like, hey, you, you think tour guides don't make a lot of money? Tour guides don't get commission. Now you can tip a tour guide if you really like how they guide you through the forest or whatever. But so just little tactful things like that, that I feel like it works on the psyche of the consumer a little bit where, you know, and also like, as a movie company, what are we selling? Mm -hmm. I thought about that. We're selling a sales executive, VP of global sale. Like what are we actually selling? We're, we're selling, selling the services. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like this could be a whole podcast, man. Like, I think <laughs> we could bust up. I think we should do like a we should do a, a podcast, some not a podcast, a morning with movers someday of like something that you truly believe is the right way, and then something I truly believe is the right way, which is complete opposites. And let us just plead our cases and let's have the people tell us, like, hey, what do you what did you think? Obviously, they both have great nuggets out of things, but I just feel like we're not selling anything. Mm -hmm. Right? I feel like we need to guide these folks through things. I mean, really, you're selling three people in a truck to pick up boxes and move it down the street? Like, yes, I get it's a service. But if someone comes and cleans my carpets, like, I guess, what am I? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, now I got my brain going a little bit here. Yeah. It's <laughs> Thursday, but now, that's what you are you technically selling. You are technically <laughs> supposed to be holding their hand, guiding them to that decision. as Like you said, like a tour guide. But at the same token, it does take a little bit more convincing at times because customers are on the fence or they want to think price. And you're like, and that's when the selling comes into place because it's like, okay, well, it's a rebuttal. And so why you should use our services? Because, hey, a tour guide might say, well, hey, okay, maybe you're right. You know, maybe they might not challenge the customer. You know, and again, it's based on preference maybe they might not challenge the decision they may guide you to the to the water and then when you get to the water oh i don't want to get in and you're like oh okay but as a seller you're like but let me tell you why you should get in you know and they're like oh well that makes a little more sense i can tell you when i was down in the <laughs> everglades um it was actually for dispatch right so i went on two airboat tours so i think i don't know if this will if it'll resonate, won't resonate, whatever the case. <laughs> the first one I went on, right? I put the head, the little headphone, almost look like what you got on your head. They had them things on, you're on the airboat, you know, this, and you could hear the guy talk a little bit, but this dude just kind of just blew through the Everglades. And every once in a while, oh yeah, over there, look at, those are mangroves. Over there, look at that. We used to, we always see an alligator over here, but there's not one today. And then just <laughs> drove around and it was like 30 minutes of that. And I'm like, well, this actually sucks. Like I was just in some dirty, murky water, this dude just drove an airboat that blew my eardrums out and I'm done. There goes 75 bucks, right? So a couple days later, got dragged into another one. I'm just like, man, I don't even want to go on this, right? So I equate that to a move, right? I met a moving consultant and they're telling me about the moving, but not really going through and guiding me through the moving process. They're just like, yep, here's your price. We're going to move you from A to B. Here we go. Do you going to take it? Did you like it? Do you not like it? That second tour I went on, this guy was, he was cracking jokes from the get-go. Now, I'm not saying we all need to crack jokes with our customer. Maybe we should, but not, you know, leading off with crazy jokes or whatever. But this dude literally, you know, gave a, a brief history about the boat, how it operates, how the steering works, how this works. Also talked about the different water temperature and what that impact that has and the water levels and when they rise and when they lower. And he didn't talk much about the mangroves, but he was just like, hey, and if you go over here and if we spin the boat this way, watch, we're going to be upstream this, that alligators are going to come down our way. Like this dude had me on edge the whole tour. And it was next thing you know, boom, the tour was over. I'm like, what the heck? Like the hour's gone all right. Like this was amazing. Same, 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 uh, how do you say? Same Everglade park or whatever you want to say. Same boat company. The difference was I had a legit tour guide versus somebody that was just kind of going through the motions, doing their job. Mm -hmm. And it was like it was crazy because you, you put that in perspective of our moving companies. You get your number one rated sales guy on the horn with a customer, you have a good chance he's probably going to book that customer is going to have a great experience. You get a rep that's not so good within your organization. What's that experience and the impact? What's that going to have on the customer? Are they really going to book with you? Yeah. So there's a lot of life things that I try to apply to, you know, not just moving, but I mean, who would have thought I'd go on an Everglade tour and try to turn this into a moving piece? But it was like, man, depending on who you come across, like I had a damn good guide. This dude gave me the history of the freaking raindrops that were coming down for Christ's sakes. It was amazing. And he had my attention the whole way. And now if this dude on it, like, and I'm terrified of big gators and I don't jump in murky water. But if this guy would have said, hey, it's safe here to jump in, fellas. Now's the time to cool off. I would have been the first one to have been like, boop, did a backflip in the water. With infested alligator water, we did a backflip. I trusted this guy and he just, he just gave a whole, he just presented and provided value right out of the gate, right out of the gate where the other guy was just, he, what he did was not wrong. The first tour guide, but he just, he toured, but provided mm -hmm. zero value up front, zero value during the tour. And then afterwards they had their tip bucket there. And I'm like, I got to tip this guy. 
<laughs> you know, I didn't bring cash for the second one because I'm like, man, this is going to be BS again. And if I would have had a hundred bucks in my pocket or any money in my pocket, I would have dumped it all in tip jar for this guy because he was, he crushed it. You could tell this guy loved what he did. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, but some things now, again, we can teach people down to a T, but it's one of those things where there's always one another way you can be doing something. And, and that, it was almost reminds me of English class. English class, your, your paper would never be at, it could be an A, but depending on the teacher's eyes, who was reading it, if it yep. was an A. So, and you can go from one professor to another, and the other professor may say, oh, this was an amazing paper. And you go back to your class, and the teacher gives you a B plus, and you're like, what do you mean? It should have been an A plus. Like, I got a reference from this. I've been happy in hell with a B plus. I was a C minus C plus kid. So, I, I was C's in every teacher's eye. It felt like they liked me, but... They didn't like what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> so similar to sales, sales is very judgmental, like how you approach it. So again, I know we talk about between touring and selling where, yes, we create scripts so that we can tour the customer through the process. But the selling aspect where it comes in at is, hey, one, are you breaking the ice when you first speak to the customer? You know, or or are you just going, hey, I'm looking for a quote for a one bedroom move. Uh, how much is it going to cost? Well, uh, well, let me go through my process. So my process, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the company and I'm going to tell you what we do. And then I'm going to give you the price. And then you go from there. The customer will go like, oh, I, no, no, I don't have the time. But if you like, oh, OK, that's no problem, you know, and you hit them with a little joke to break the ice. Oh, hey, how, even ask, hey, how's your day going? And yeah. they're like, oh, it's going. Oh, yours too? You know, and, you know, just that little sniping remark can just get the customer like, okay, you know, got a little humor here. And hey, you broke into the door. You got into that door. Now you go through your spill. You know that when you got into that door and the customer gave you a little energy, you got that time to go through the motions. And and then you got time to rebuttal if they have a, if they have an objection. So it's it's how you do it, and I think that's the selling part versus the touring part. Yep, I had the three questions I always ask after introducing myself. You know, the phone rings, introduce myself. Hey, it's Ryan with XX Moving Company. How can I assist you? Blah, blah, blah. And someone's like, Hey, I'm looking to get a price quote and a move and this and this and that, whatever. Minus asking origin, destination, all that stuff. Man, I had three questions that I always ask. And I don't know if we covered this a couple of weeks ago or whatever, but my first question I always asked was, basically, are you excited for your upcoming move? And that opened the door. That basically set the tone of the call because one of two things, either A, and you know this from your world, either people are excited to move or they're super stressed, not happy, all these other issues, problems, whatever. So if they're excited for the mood, move, leading with excitement, right? Finding out why they're excited for the move. Are they moving closer to family? Uh, is the husband wife retiring? So now they finally, they saved for 30 years. They're, they're getting that home in Florida or on the, uh, in Long Island or wherever the heck it is. But at the same time, if they're not excited to be moving because, you know, the husband was forced to take a job on the West Coast, the wife was forced to take a job on the East Coast, that now they're moving away from family that they, you know, grew up in a small town, what have you. I know I could leave a little bit more empathy. And I knew I had to basically handle this move with a little bit more kid gloves. Second question was basically, have you ever moved professionally before? Right. Not just move before, because everybody's moved in a pickup truck, a van or something like that, but professionally. And you know what's going to happen there, because most people that move professionally have had a bad experience. And if they had a really, really good experience, you think they're probably calling your moving company or are they going to call the moving company that already moved them last year or six months ago or two years ago because they left such a lasting impression? So when I ask question two, if you moved professionally before, it was always, oh, yeah, I have. They dented this, they scratched this, they broke my hummels, they they broke my china. I had four pieces of artwork that I said can't be damaged. I packed it, they dropped it, they this, they that. So question two basically helped me build an outline of a solid relocation, like a custom program for them um, based on their level of excitement or stress or what have you. And the third question is, what's the best way to communicate with you and what are the best times? Phone mm -hmm. text that assisted with my follow-up and almost showing them that, hey, I'm not just going to call you randomly. Like if I have something to ask or I have something to present, what is the best time that I can capture your attention? Because this is 
you know, th this is not just a small little piece. Like we're not just moving your boxes and furniture. We are picking up your life and we are moving your life somewhere else. So between that and providing custom options, like when I say providing custom options, it was if a customer said, I'm doing all the packing, I don't need you guys to do that besides mattresses. No big deal. I sent them that quote over immediately. And then once they open that quote, I would send over a quote based on question number two. Have you ever moved professionally before? Mind you, I took good notes. I listened. My calls are recorded. I knew that the dishes were smashed the last time. I knew that their artwork on the wall got scratched, dinged up, all this. And I knew that they banged up the floor. So my second quote I would send to them that they didn't know was coming was, yes, Dwight is still doing majority of the packing. However, Ryan's Moving Company is going to handle your glassware, your four pieces of art, because I don't want you to have the experience that you did the, the last time. Mm -hmm. So you'd have two layers or levels of pricing, two levels of service. Then 24 hours later, I'd send the full service quote. So now, because you know, oftentimes you send a pack by owner quote, fictitious numbers, two grand. Then you send a pack, a full pack. It could be another two thousand dollars worth of just packing alone. So now you're up to four k. So now mm -hmm. you now the consumer's mind is, man, I'm paying just as much for packing as the entire move. I don't see the value in that. So the ability to stair step it, two grand is, hey, you're going to do your packing and you're not going to have the experience that you had last time. I hope. However, you're doing a good majority of the packing, so really it's up to you on how well you pack. Second quote, maybe it was three k. Third quote, 4K. So now that two to four doesn't seem too crazy because they've already sold themselves on three. So now mm -hmm. the jump, is, instead of a jump from two to four, the jump is three to four. You tie them with capacity-based pricing, you're almost get, doing away with leaning on price and being that price point mover. It's more about level of service and uh, you know, can the customer pivot based on dates? But that always, those three basic questions, man, opened up the door of communication. And that's where the jokes, the fun, this, the that, that's, that's where, that's where the magic happened was within those three questions all the time. So my head is exploding. Cause that was a lot of gems right there. And I had so many <laughs> like points of entry and I was just like, you know, this is good, but no. It, and the thing is when they do use professional movers, sometimes your questions is key to, because that movie company set a benchmark if they were good. And we've gotten to jobs where customers are like, well, where's the boxes? Where's the boxes? Where's something that you want to do a pack and move? And it's just like, but you didn't you didn't actually want packing service. Oh, well, the last mover they included it into their whole bundle. That's but that's again, that's the value of transparency. And every time I had a customer. Because again, I gave out many quotes, right? I gave out three quotes per move, if not more, you know. Sometimes we'd have that that middle ground where it's like, hey, we're packing dishes, we're doing artwork. Sometimes we didn't pack 10 pieces of artwork, the customer would back it down to six, or sometimes that 10 would turn into 14 if the value is there um, and what have you. Plus, you got to think these customers are calling more than just your moving company, probably. Everybody has different processes, everybody does some companies bundle, some companies it's a la carte. So put that consumer hat on that customer hat on if they're talking to Dwight's moving company and then they call Ryan's moving company we're we're probably pitching two different things so are they going to be blending some of Dwight's into Ryan's or some of Ryan's into Dwight's now they sign up with Dwight Ryan was talking about this uh you know pack bundle Dwight's not but they're assuming that hey did Dwight say that did Ryan say they're not sure so every time I get a customer that would say hey I want to move with you I want to go with this option I would set up a five minute phone call and it's a more touch points. Right. But I would just say, I just want to make sure because you've talked to a lot of moving companies. You've said you got multiple quotes. I just want to make sure that, you know, what we're doing for you, you understand. And also what you're doing for us with us, basically role clarity, right? This is what you're responsible for, Mr. Customer. This is what our company is responsible for. And I would review that. Hey, you're doing all of the packing. We're just packing your mattresses. That's it. Yes. We're going to pad, protect your furniture, but boom, but other than that, you're doing everything. And then well, oftentimes. And I was going to say, you're right. I would say something like that. And again, it depends on the person, but I would like for all the reps to do it. Ultimately, is hey, recap that service you gave them. And granted, you emailed them an uh, estimate. Summarize your services. Yeah. Recap everything that you got, you gave to them. Hey, it's going to be $800, but that, uh, well, don't go away $800 first, but like, hey, it's going to be three guys, two, um, one truck for four hours with a half an hour travel fee, um, you're going to be looking at $800 just as a recap. 
Okay, great. That's no problem. All right, perfect. So what I'm going to have you do next is I'm going to have you sign this estimate, seeing the breakdowns, you have access to the terms and conditions as well. And then basically we will take a 25% down deposit. So it's like you're reiterating it, you're signing it. At this point, you know, you get to the job, you shouldn't even hear anything about, well, I thought you guys were going to be packing and everything like that. Did you not just, you know, hear the conversation, sign the estimate, and nowhere on your say drive me crazy is is we had somebody that literally would be like, Well, it's on the paperwork. Customers should have known. Well, yeah, this is back before we had CRM systems and all that. You mean the amount of paperwork that'd be presented to a customer was like more than buying a house. And it's like you can't now, yes, is the consumer responsible to read everything? Sure. Just like when I sign a contract or whatever, do I read every little fine print, this, that? Absolutely not. That's probably one of my biggest faults is I'm like, hey, if this is a service I'm signing, you coming to fix my washer or dryer, you're coming to fix my washer and dryer. I'm not reading the fine print. Like, I just trust that you're going to do what you're doing. But, you know, I hate always, you know, if a customer ever had an issue, it was always, you know, it, once upon a time, I should say, we we did, we we. <laughs> We change really, really quickly after a number of these things kept popping through. I'm like, I just don't understand. We keep reverting back to the, the, the paperwork. Well, yeah, paperwork's super important, but if the customer was confused and not sure what they're getting into, that's on me. That's on that tour guide. You know, if somebody's yeah. terrified of boats and water, what are they doing in an Everglade tour? They should have known that they were going on an Everglade tour, not, hey, you're going to go look at boats today. Then they show up and it's like, no, you're going to hop in a boat with gators all around you. And they're terrified, like, no, 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 no. Well, you, you didn't read the paperwork that you signed? Well, no, because I thought I was doing this. Now I'm well, actually doing this. I think depending on the level of risk, you need to read. Like, okay, I've skydived three times and I plan on doing more. But, you know, and I, I want to do it. it. You got to let me know your hookup there. I've, I've, I've been saying for years I want to jump out of a plane, which is hey. absolutely crazy to me. But I, I want to do it. I let me know. It. There's a spot down in Albany, not too far, far away in the Waynesburg area. We, can, we could definitely go. Um, you know, on my 40th birthday, I want to jump out of a plane. So we got a little bit of time before that shows up. Here, but uh, yeah, a great way to ring in 40 and maybe the shoot won't open. We'll see. Oh, boy. I, uh, let's not jinx it. But, you know, but basically <laughs> when you do sign those contracts, like they have a lot of checkpoints and they want you to initial you and et cetera like that. And they're like, well, hey, you know what? You're, um, if something happens to you, whether it's death or whatever or long term injuries, you know, you can't have you can't sue us or have your next of kin to us. And it's just like, these are the things that you want to read because you're assuming the risk. And yeah. I get with moving, there's pages and pages of information. I think my terms and conditions is probably easily, probably like 10 pages, you know, of just different um, paragraphs of information. And no one is reading through all of it, but there are those customers that read through it and they try to hold you to your word. Like, oh, well, I looked at paragraph 4.5 and it said that, you know, if I canceled here or if I, you know, whatever, you know, I would, um, I'm entitled to this. And you're just like, well, you're right, because those are the terms that we wrote. They did their due diligence, right? But those are things that we should be explaining, I feel like, uh, throughout the process. As a good relocation guide, there should be no surprises throughout any aspect of it. And if there is a surprise, that's not the customer's fault. But that's I think you got, I think you do have to limit, you got to get to the, you got to get to the meat and potatoes. You got to hit them with the most important stuff of those 13 pages because their their mind is focused on that move. Yep. So if you're talking about, if you're not talking about valuation, but then they file a claim and you're like, well, hey, did you not see that you signed up for 60 cents per pound? You know, that's different. You know, and I always used to tell the customers when I work second call, not on a sales call, on a second call, hey, I just want to go over this valuation part of it. It's not something I'm proud to have to talk about, but it's something that we need to talk about because in the worst case scenario, something happens on your job. You know, um, we have these few options for you. Do you want full value protection? Do you want, um, you know, up to $2,500 or do you want six or would you be accepting 30 cents per pound because New York had different valuation options? I and, love the conversation. conversation. Uh, that was like maybe one and a half because it was no... <laughs> I wasn't trying to upsell it or this or that. It was, again, back to, have you ever moved professionally before? When they said, hey, I tried to make a claim and I didn't realize I had 30 cents, 60 cents. I thought I had full value. They give, the customer will give you all that information. So to me, it was like, hey, based on your last move, you mentioned you, you had to make a claim. Unfortunately, no move is absolutely perfect. Things do happen on moves. There will be a scratch. And I was the first one to say, there will be some sort of scratch on something. We might put a little dent into something. 
However, the difference between our company and others is if we do damage, we're going to point it out to you and we're going to step up and take care of it. However, we can only do what we can do. If you have health insurance and you get sick, you go to the hospital, your bill is going to be a heck of a lot less coming out of that hospital than it is if you don't have insurance. Now, I personally, I hate health insurance. I pay astronomical amounts of money every year to have it for the family. But guess what? And thank God I did because of a situation we had that happened last year. I'd still be paying. I'd be millions of dollars in debt right now if we didn't have health and cover, health coverage. Just put it that way. So mm-hmm. I broke it down that way. And hey, if you if you want to have this, if there is going to be a claim, you know, I, I prefer you do purchase the four hundred dollars worth of valuation coverage, and I hope you never have to use it. Just yeah. like, do I you have health coverage? But I hope you never have to go through a ridiculous journey where you need to leverage every aspect of it, and you're like, wow. But at mm-hmm. the same time. I hope you have health coverage in the event that you do get sick. Yeah. If you don't, guess what? You're healthy. Life is good. You're out a couple hundred bucks. Big deal. Definitely. But, All right, everybody. So we are at the top of the hour. Oh, man. And there is just so much more we could have been uh, talking about today. But I keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to save some of this for next week. So we'll see you all next Thursday. And y'all, y'all keep going out there crushing it. Again, um, break your departments up, break your company up into departments and really systematize your company. You know, um, you thank me later for it, but it's one of those things where if your mind is all over the place and you don't know left from right, you're going to be stuck. Um, anything on your end, Ryan, before we take off? No, man, just congrats to Mr. and Mrs. Mac, baby. Heck yeah. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. Uh, Get, getting used to it. <laughs> it's only been a while. Not even a week yet there. But yeah, I'm, I'm coming up on 10 years, actually, of uh, jumping off the bridge, so to say. So August 2nd of uh, 2024 will be 10 years. So uh, yeah, systematize your marriages as well. Uh, departmentalize that sh- <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, all right, yeah. Um, next, maybe next time y'all see us, we'll be skydiving. You never know. But all right, y'all. Y'all take care.